Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Right, thank you. Shabbat Shalom. And before we start, I want to give a big shout out to Abraham. Great job today. Thank you. It's a joy to see you going in the Lord and stepping into manhood, Abraham. You did an awesome job on the Hebrew, uh, on, your, on your drash, uh, uh, on, on all the preparation that I know you worked so very hard on. So, uh, Mazel Tov, congratulations. And, we, and we're in a series, uh, verse-by-verse series, throughout the entire uh, Gospel of Mark. Today is part three, and we're going to see today uh, three things. We're going to see Yeshua launch his public ministry uh, and proclaim the Gospel and display his power. So turn with me to Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. Mark 1, 14 to 34. After John was put in prison, Yeshua went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the gospel. As Yeshua walked beside the Sea of Galilee, He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Yeshua said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum. And when Shabbat came, Yeshua went into the synagogue to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, and not as their Torah teachers. Just then, a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an evil spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Yeshua of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One of God. Be quiet. Yeshua said sternly, come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were so amazed that they asked each other, who is this? Uh, uh, And what is this? Uh, A new teaching and with authority. He 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 even gives orders to the evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread over the whole region, spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Yeshua about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Yeshua all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered uh, at the door, and Yeshua healed many who had various diseases, and he drove out many demons. But he would not let the demons speak, for they knew who he was. Amen. Uh, this extensive passage here, it portrays the very beginning of Yeshua's ministry. We see here the, the core gospel message. We see him calling his first disciples. And this ministry is threefold ministry of teaching, healing, and casting out demons. Uh, and we're going to see six things here. Now, most preachers have three points. We're going to see six things here we learn about Yeshua uh, on the overhead. So we learn here, number one, he is the king. Number two, he's the king of your salvation. Number three, he's the king of your mind. Number four, he's the king of your heart. Number five, he's the king of your life path. And finally, number six, he's the king who can be trusted. So first, he is the king. Look at Mark 1, verse 14. After John was put in prison, Yeshua went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled, he said. The kingdom of God, Bokut HaShemayim, has come near. Uh, Repent and believe the gospel. This is the first thing Yeshua preaches when he opens his public ministry. When Yeshua says, the time is fulfilled, uh, he uses two very interesting words here. The first word is is kairos, uh, for time. Unlike the word chronos, which refers to chronological time, the word kairos refers to a particular moment in time that is so significant that it defines everything that comes after it. It's historic. 
And the second and interesting word Yeshua uses here, the word that we translate as, as fulfilled, it's the word pleroma. Pleroma means super fullness. Yeshua then says, the kingdom of God has come near, or, or literally is at hand. And the term at hand, yes, it means near, uh, but Yeshua wasn't just saying the kingdom of God was near uh, in, in, in terms of the clock. Rather, he meant it was at hand physically. The kingdom of God was at hand because the king was there. The people, you, you could reach out to him and touch him. The long-awaited Messiah had come. The chaotic moment was unfolding in the person of Yeshua. The kingdom of God is at hand. Why? Because the king had come. Yeshua is the king. He is the one who brings the kingdom. And, and in light of this, I am always amazed, saddened and amazed at the number of these so-called Christian Zionist uh, ministries who have this idealized uh, and romanticized view uh, of Orthodox Israelis and constantly gush over how they're longing for the kingdom the same as we are. And we just need to love and support them uh, where they're at uh, and not share the gospel with them. But you can't have a kingdom without the king. When the kingdom comes, our fellow Jews will not be able to enter in if they don't know the king. So if we really love them, we share the good news of King Yeshua with them. That's the coming of the kingdom. So on the overhead, Yeshua is king. He's the one who brings the kingdom. The kingdom has come near because Yeshua, the king, is here. And in the Bible, the kingdom of God, it's, it's the healing and renewing exercise of God's ruling power. So here's my definition again. The kingdom of God is the healing and renewing exercise of God's ruling power. In the Hebrew scriptures, we see four key things about this kingdom. The kingdom of God on the overhead. Uh, number one, uh, and, and Isaiah 40, uh, Mark, Mark chapter 1, in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark quotes Isaiah 40 and other scriptures that say the world is in such a mess that one day God himself will come and put it right. God himself will come. Uh, and then number two, in places like 2 Samuel 7, uh, Isaiah 1, Isaiah 11, the Bible says this messianic king will be from the line of David. And he'll rule and he'll reign. He'll end poverty and war and suffering. He'll make the world right. He, unite all, he will unite all the peoples of the world. Uh, so number one, he, God himself will come. Number two, he's, he's the Davidic king. Number three, we see in Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, that God will enter into a new relationship with us. A new covenant. That will finally deal with the evil in our hearts. A new spirit and a new heart they will finally change us. And then number four, and we see in Genesis 1 and 2, when God created the world, it was a paradise. There was no death, no war, no crime, no oppression, no suffering, no disease, no evil, because God himself was present and in control. He completely ruled and reigned. Now, imagine a great car, perfect condition, an expensive car, a miracle of engineering, a wonderful car, and in the driver's seat, driving the car is a five-year-old. The car was under the control of this five-year-old. What will happen? Bad things. <laughs> Bad things will happen. And you could put them under the category of disintegration. <laughs> things will fall apart. Uh, Lamp posts, stop signs, walls, uh, the car itself. Maybe you if you're in the car with him. <laughs> disintegration. Why? Because there's something wrong with the car? No, the car is fine. <laughs> but it wasn't built to be under the control of a five-year-old. In the same way, your life uh, was created, the world was created, the human race was created to be under the, under the loving rulership of the Lord. Not for us to be independently in charge of our own life. We were created to worship and serve the Lord, to be under His control. And when you live your life without God, uh, God uh, um, and, and being under your own control, it's actually worse than having a five-year-old drive a car. <laughs> and we see in Genesis 2, as soon as we turned away from God, as soon as we said, we're going to be in charge of our own life, we're going to put ourselves in the driver's seat, everything starts to fall apart. 
William Butler Yeats, famous British poet, says this in the overhead, the center cannot hold. Your anarchy is loosed upon the world. We fall apart. We fall apart spiritually, psychologically, socially, even physically. When we try to control our own life, it all falls apart. Why? Because we were built to serve him. And when we instead serve ourselves, and we're our own lords and our own masters, our own kings, when God's ruling power no longer holds sway over us, over our life, over our world, things fall apart. Because we're going against the grain of the universe. We're going against, against the fabric of reality. Here's a very small example. Let's say someone wrongs you, really wrongs you. What should you do? Yeshua says, our king says, you must forgive. Uh, it's, the God, it's the word of God. It's a commandment. Uh, you must forgive. You must, you must no longer hold a grudge uh, against that person uh, or seek retribution, but forgive him or her from your heart. Now, what if we don't? What if we refuse? If you won't forgive, and you take, you take, you're taking your own life in your hands, you're being your own Lord and Master. You're making yourself the judge of that person. You're sitting yourself in the judgment seat. And what's going to happen? If you're really angry at them, bad things will happen. Disintegration. Uh, it won't be good for you. Uh, it won't be good for you psychologically, uh, because you'll be racked with fear and with anger. It won't be good for, other, for, for you for other relationships you have. If, if you stay angry at this person, you'll tend to generalize uh, and, and get more easily angered at others. It'll hurt your relationships. No one likes a bitter person. It might hurt you even physically. Uh, holding on to your anger, it creates stress uh, and ulcers and high blood pressure and, and, and heart problems. What's going on? It's a miniature version of what happened in Genesis. It's a miniature version of what happens all the time. So on the overhead, with this background of these four themes of the kingdom in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, the king is God, uh, Messiah is, is the Davidic king, the king brings a new covenant, gives you a new heart and a new spirit, uh, and the king restores the paradise from the Garden of Eden. Uh, what then does it mean when Mark says that Yeshua is this king? Uh, and that therefore, with his coming, Yeshua says the kingdom of God is at hand. It means that when we enter back under his lordship, we then finally begin to heal. Things start, instead of disintegrating, things start to come together. But there's something very important to see here. Yeshua says, the kingdom of God has come near, it's at hand. And what you see throughout the rest uh, of the new covenant scriptures is that even though Yeshua brings the kingdom of God, it's not yet here in its fullness. It's only here partially. And here's why. Most people who heard Yeshua, when they heard Yeshua say, I'm the king, I'm bringing the kingdom of God, they were startled. Because they had read the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures. It looked like to them that the kingdom of God comes all at once. Everything is dark. Now the kingdom of God comes and brings the light. There's a number of passages in the Hebrew scriptures, such as Isaiah 11, with this great king, this heir of David, he comes and makes everything right. But there was also in the Hebrew scriptures, these other passages as well, uh, that didn't get the same notoriety at the time. Uh, like the now famous suffering servant passages like Isaiah 42, Isaiah 53. These passages talk about some mysterious figure uh, who comes to suffer for his people. And in the first century, the Jewish religious leaders didn't, did not understand uh, that this suffering servant could also be the messianic king. They couldn't figure out how this could happen. How can this be? In fact, to, to solve this mystery, uh, they came up with this theory there had to be two messiahs uh, instead of one messiah coming twice. But Yeshua is the messiah who doesn't come once but twice to set everything right. He comes the first time not in power and judgment to put down all evil, uh, but in weakness to bring mercy and grace and atonement. And someday, I think soon, he will return at the end of time to put down all evil. And then the kingdom of God will be here in its fullness. And what this means is right now, if you are in a true saving relationship with him, 
You begin to heal, but not fully. It's not the kingdom yet in its fullness. So, for example, take your self-image, uh, your identity. If you're from a traditional culture, your identity is based on, on living up to what your parents think you should do. If you come from a religious background, your identity is rooted in being a very good person who obeys all the religious rules. Uh, and you're very spiritual and you're very religious. If you come from a secular background, which is modern American society, uh, then your identity is based on your performance, on your achievement. Uh, I've achieved this and this and this, and that's my identity, that's my sense of worth, uh, which in modern America, which is modern American society, in our society, I feel good about myself if I express myself. And, I, and I'm being who I think I should be based on my own inner desires. Now, all these models for identity, uh, uh, traditional culture, religious culture, secular culture, all these models for identity will ultimately crush you. Yeshua comes in contrast. He says, I give you an identity and a worth not based on your family, not based on your religiosity, not based on your personal performance or achievement, but rooted in the knowledge of the love and love of who you are in me. And then you begin to heal. And the relationships can also then begin to heal. Because of the incredible capital you've got now got in your identity, uh, in the Messiah. Uh, so now you're, you're able to forgive. And you're able to be open. And you're able to recognize the humanity of those who are different from you, who look different, who speak different, who have different views. You recognize their humanity. It begins to change your perspective. You realize that God, God is in charge and he knows what he's doing. So when bad things happen, instead of freaking out, you say, maybe there's some reason for it. So in all these sorts of ways, when you enter into a relationship with King Yeshua, you begin to heal. Why? Because the kingdom of God in Yeshua has come near. So the overhead, number one, he's the king. Number two, he's the king of your salvation. Because he doesn't just say the kingdom of God is at hand, but he then goes on to say, repent and believe the good news. Now, the word he uses here for, for good news uh, is, is gospel. It's a Greek word, euangelion, or evangelion. Uh, uh, the good message, the good news. The word gospel means news of a great historic event. It's a report or news of some incredible thing that's happened uh, on the overhead. It, what, this word was not used for daily news. No. It meant some great event that changes history and changes your life. So, for example, we have an inscription that's come down to us in the Greek from the first century that reads like this. The beginning of the gospel of Caesar Augustus. It was an announcement of his coronation. When Augustus became emperor of Rome, it changed the world. It was history-making. It was life-changing for everyone living in the Roman Empire. And therefore, it was a gospel, a, a proclamation of historic news. So what was Yeshua saying when he said, my message is the gospel, a gospel, actually the gospel? What he's saying is, I am different from every other religious leader you've ever heard of or ever will hear of. Because in every other religion, it's the core message is not news. But advice, advice, meaning instruction of how you should live. Every other religion says to get to heaven or, or to reach the divine, you have to live like this, you have to do these things, and then you'll, you'll connect with, with God, then you'll be able to commune with the divine, uh, enter paradise in the overhead. And therefore, the core message of every other religion is always advice. Advice about what you must do. But in contrast... For Yeshua faith, the core message is not advice, it's news. Not what you must do to connect to God, but what, what has already been done. It's news that Yeshua has died and rose again, and that he did it for you to atone for your sins. You see, if you're saved by what you do, then the core of religion is advice. But if you're saved by what Yeshua has done, and we access his finished work by repentance and faith, and the core message of Messianic faith is not advice, but news. The central message of Messianic Judaism isn't that you're saved by your record or your past, but because of Yeshua's record 
and Yeshua is passed. Indeed, the moment you repent and trust in God and trust in this good news and rest in that and say, Father, accept me for what, because of what Yeshua has done, that moment you are as loved by God as you will be a billion years from now when you're perfect and glorious. And the minute you repent and trust in him, you begin to participate in the kingdom. But if instead you continue to think that Yeshua faith is advice, that this advice model, if you view Messianic faith as basically advice, advice on how you should live and, and how to be saved, and how to obtain God's blessing, if you continue to use this advice paradigm instead of uh, to understand Christianity and Messianic Judaism, then you are cut off from the kingdom of God. You're not connected to God. It's only when you shift your paradigm from advice to news, uh, uh, and you acknowledge that it's not based on how I live, but how, how, how Yeshua has lived. It's not based on what I've done, but what Yeshua has done, that is what saves you. And then you begin to participate in the kingdom. Then you begin to heal. And when Yeshua returns and sets up the fullness of his kingdom, then you'll say, the exile from paradise is over. I've come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've always been looking for my whole life, but didn't know it. And now I want you to notice how central repentance is, the shuva, repentance is to Yeshua's gospel message. Sadly, this key element is missing today from so many so-called gospel messages. But Yeshua's gospel was repent and believe. The moment the king came was a moment of profound crisis. In Greek, this word crisis it means, also means judgment. When the kingdom broke through and Messiah appeared, it brought the most profound crisis mankind has ever faced. And the crisis was this. Those who repented and trusted in Yeshua would receive eternal life. Those who did not would face God's judgment. Yeshua was saying to our fellow Jews, your crisis is right now. And he's saying the same thing to you and to me today. No one can hear the gospel and walk away indifferent. When you receive the gospel, it's, it's the greatest moment of your life. But if you reject the gospel, you bring the greatest judgment upon yourself. And today, what pa- what much of what passes for the gospel consists of things like a call to come forward, uh, uh, raise your hand, uh, sign this card, pray this sinner's prayer. But without a clear call to repentance, to leave your old life behind, it's nothing but cheap grace. So let me be clear. No one can enter the kingdom of God without repentance. That is, without fleeing from your sin and putting your trust in Yeshua alone. And this is how Yeshua himself did evangelism. He proclaimed the gospel and he said, your response must be to repent and believe in me, the king. So on the overhead, number one, Yeshua is the king. Number two, he's king of your salvation. Number three, he's king of your mind. Mark 1, verse 21. They went to Capernaum and when Shabbat had come, Yeshua went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the Torah teachers. Yeshua's authority was dramatically different from from the Torah teachers uh, in two key ways. First, when the Pharisees and the scribes uh, and the Torah teachers taught, they always did so by citing other earlier rabbis uh, for their authority. So, you read a page of Talmud, uh, for example, it always says something like this. Uh, Rabbi Akiva says in the name of Rabbi Gamalia, who says in the name of Rabbi Yaakov, such and such. They would always cite other rabbis uh, for their authority. Uh, kind of like scholars do today with, with footnotes and citations. But not Yeshua. He never quoted other rabbis. He spoke of his own He spoke on his own intrinsic authority. Number two, secondly, the Torah teaches that they wanted to to appeal to the ultimate authority, uh, they would also cite the scriptures uh, as well. And they would say, it is written. Even the prophets who had direct revelation would say, thus saith the Lord. 
But Yeshua comes along and he says, I say unto you. Yeshua claimed original, not derived authority. Even the prophets never dared to speak like this. They would say, it is written, or, or thus saith the Lord. But Yeshua says, I say unto you. Or in the old King James, verily, verily, I say unto you. And we don't realize how, ast how astounding that statement is. Literally, he was saying, amen, amen, I say unto you. Now, in first century Jewish tradition, when the synagogue was assembled and somebody was speaking, the elders would all be seated, sit up front in the front row, and it was their job to make sure that whatever the speaker was saying was true to the scriptures. And so the elders needed to ratify it. And so after the person would speak, if the elders agreed with the message, they'd say, amen. But do you know what Yeshua was doing when he teaches? He starts his message with amen, amen. He's saying, I am not going to let you judge me. You do not have the right to judge me. The Torah teachers have no right to judge whether what Yeshua says is true in their opinion. That'd be kind of like some preacher getting up today and saying, well, Yeshua taught this and this, and rightly so, I think. <laughs> Yeshua says, you can't say that. Because if I am who I say I am, and I am, <laughs> if I am the divine Messiah, I am the Son of God, the divine Son of Man from Daniel 7, that I must have authority over your mind, over your intellect. Even if your culture today says one thing, and your personal opinion says one thing, uh, even if your reason says one thing, you must nonetheless believe what I say. I speak as God because that's who I am. I have intrinsic authority in and of myself, so you must believe what I'm telling you. So today, if you find some teaching of Yeshua you don't like, uh, like for example, his teachings on hell, or, or sexual purity, uh, or, or forgiving your enemies, uh, or being generous with your money, uh, or that he's the, you know, his exclusive claim to authority is the only way to God. If something doesn't fit in your current cultural climate, uh, and, and, and the intellectual party line of, of today's secular thought police, you can't say, well, I like a lot of Yeshua's teachings, but I disagree with him, him here and here. I can't follow him over there. No. Where do you get the grid that you're putting down on Yeshua to decide what things you accept and what things you don't? Where does that grid come from? What well, could be higher than him? When you say, I respect Yeshua, oh, but I can't follow everything in the New Covenant Scriptures, I can't follow all of his teachings, what you're saying is, I don't really believe Yeshua is who he says he is. Uh, he must be a fraud uh, or a lunatic, but he could not be the Son of God. Because if he is, he must have authority over your mind. If he is who he says he is, and he is, you cannot pick and choose which of his teachings you like. You must fall on your face before him and obey him. So number one, Yeshua is king. Number two, he's king of your salvation. Number three, he's king over your mind. Number four, he's king over your heart. Look at Mark 1, 23. Thus that a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an impure spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Yeshua of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Oh, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Yeshua said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. Now, the main way demons work is to aggravate pre-existing problems and conditions and sin tendencies we already have within us. They take normal human depravity and they make it considerably more demonic and more twisted and worse than it otherwise would have been. But here's the important point about this passage of Yeshua driving out this demon uh, on the overhead. As far as the Bible is concerned, demon possession is only the extreme end of a condition that we are all in. Because the Bible says we're all slaves to sin until Yeshua liberates us. Until the King liberates us. Because we're all under the control of something. We're all possessed by something. There's a secular author I really like, uh, David Foster Wallace, 
he had this now famous uh, commencement address at, at Kenyon College. Uh, and he says something like this. And remember, he's a secular author. He doesn't believe in, believe in God. But he says this, and I'll put it on the overhead. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everyone has to worship something. Live for something. The only choice you get is what to worship. You probably, he, said, he goes on to say, you probably should worship God or Jesus or Allah or, or some supreme being. Because anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if there where you cap real meaning in your life, you'll never have enough. You'll never feel you have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, you always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you'll die a million deaths before they finally take you away. Worship power, and you end up feeling weak and afraid, and you'll need more and more power over others to numb you to your own fears. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But then he goes on to say, but the insidious thing about all these forms of worship, tapping into the meaning, is that they're unconscious. They're your default setting. Wow. Now notice what he says. He says, if you, he says that if your heart treasures these things, any of these things, as a priority, uh, as an epi-desire, an over-desire, if you either consciously or unconsciously worship them, they'll eat you alive. They will consume you. So if you live for power or money or beauty or approval, whatever you live for, you're going to have to have it in order to feel good about yourself. Indeed, to feel like you even have a self. And if something gets in the way, you're paralyzed by fear or by overwhelming anger towards whatever's blocking you. And in this sense, you are possessed. And the only thing Yeshua says that can liberate you is me. Why? Because Yeshua says, I am the only master who will not eat you alive. I'm the only master who will forgive you when you fail. If you worship your career and you have a setback, uh, you have a failure in your career, your career will never forgive you. If you worship beauty, the mirror will never forgive you. Never. <laughs> Yeshua said in the overhead, I'm the only master who will forgive you when you fail. On the overhead, please. Yeshua says, if I'm the source of your value and your meaning and your hope, I forgive. I'm the only master who will not eat you alive. Now, how does this healing begin? Look at the first four people who are called here to be disciples. Look at Mark 1.16. It's sure he walked beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Yeshua says, and I'll make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, his brother John. They were in a boat preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Notice several astounding things here. First, these guys all had a job. But Yeshua says, I must be more important than even your job. Second, they had a father. Uh, and this is a, a patriarchal culture. But Yeshua says, I've got to be more important even than your family. You have to, you've got to love me and trust me and serve me more even than your father. I must have supremacy in your life. Because otherwise, you, your life will not truly begin to heal. When Yeshua bids a man to come to him, he bids him to come and die. <laughs> Yeshua, when Yeshua calls you, he's calling you to fully give your life to him. You must leave all, surrender all, die to yourself, take up your cross, follow him. My holy brothers and sisters, you are what you love the most. And what's wrong with us is that the loves in our heart are disordered. They're out of order. So for example, if you love your job more than your children, you're going to destroy your family. But if you love your children more than you love God, you're going to smother and crush your children. 
Only if things are, are reordered will your life start to work. And you won't be eaten up uh, by fear and anger and anxiety because you no longer need these things so much as your highest priority. You can have them, you can enjoy them, but you don't need them. They're not your, your end all and be all. And so Yeshua must be king of your heart. Yeshua looks at the heart. He's constantly after your heart. Over and over in the Gospels, it says, Yeshua discovered what was in their hearts. He saw what was in their hearts. Why? Because he says in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there also is your heart. Whatever you treasure the most controls your whole life. If you treasure anything other than Yeshua most in your heart, then you're under the control of those other things. Those other things then become an idol. And they eat you alive. Here's a test. If you say, I'll be very happy to obey you, Yeshua, if... Da, 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 whatever's on the other side of that if is your real God. And ultimately, it will eat you alive. There can be no conditions or limitations on Yeshua's supremacy in your life. Or else he is not the king. He's not king of your heart your mind, your salvation. So the overhead, number one, he's the king. Number two, he's king of your salvation. Number three, he's king of your mind. Number four, he's king of your heart. Number five, he's also king of your life path. When Yeshua calls his disciples, he doesn't just say, obey me. He says, follow me. Follow me. You call not just to obey him, but more comprehensively, you're called to follow him. On the overhead. This word follow meant not just to show up in a class where Yeshua was teaching, like today in a modern college class, but to actually live with him, to center your whole life around him, and to have an intimate, personal relationship with him. And so to really participate in the kingdom, uh, uh, and to really see the healing that you need uh, to your perspectives and motives and priorities and relationships and your self-image, you must truly be his disciple. And the overhead. What are some things, uh, uh, evidences of discipleship? You must have a vibrant prayer life. You must be a worshiper. You must study and meditate on his word if you want to be his disciple. You must be in fellowship with other believers. You must be in a community where you're accountable to others. And you must be sharing your faith and serving others. But in addition to, to the words, the verb to follow also means you're going somewhere. When you're following someone, you're going somewhere. Yeshua says, you have to follow me, whatever you do. You have to stay faithful to me, whatever happens, and wherever you go, and whatever you do. Follow me means I'm going to take you somewhere. And you must be faithful to me, whatever you do, wherever I take you. Now, of these four apostles, where were they taken? Uh, the, the, the Yeshua calls here in Mark chapter 1 to follow him. Peter, Andrew, James, John. Well, we know that the first three, uh, Peter, Andrew, James, they were all martyred. They were killed for their faith. And the fourth one, John, was tortured and died in exile. They faithfully followed Yeshua, but please note as we enter more and more into these last days, it was not always an easy, pain-free path. Now, on the overhead, I want you to hear me well. There's nothing more crucial to being a disciple. There's nothing more crucial to giving Yeshua the kingship of your life. There's nothing more crucial to participating in God's kingdom and getting this inner healing than when your life path becomes dark and difficult and confusing and painful. It doesn't even seem like he's there. You can't feel him. You feel like Yeshua's abandoned you. At these times, you must be faithful to him anyways. You keep following him wherever he takes you. You keep following him whatever you do. There's a great novel, children's story, that beautifully illustrates this point. Uh, Christian writer uh, from over 100 years ago, George MacDonald, wrote this fairy tale called The Princess and the Goblins. It's about a little girl named Irene. And she's in this kingdom where there's lots of goblins. She lives in this big house, and in the attic lives her fairy grandmother. 
And the fairy grandmother gives Irene a magic ring and attaches a ball of thread uh, to the ring. Uh, and, and she says to Irene, she says to her, I'm going to keep this ball of thread with me. And the thread is so fine you can't see it, but you can feel it. And if you ever get in trouble, put the ring under your pillow and follow your thread and it, and, and with your finger and it will take you to me. But then the fairy, fairy uh, grandmother warned her, now the thread may take you in a very roundabout way, but eventually, yes, it will take you to me. And the grandmother emphasized, you must always follow your thread whatever you do. And so one night, Irene, uh, she, she wakes up, she hears noises in the dark, realizes the goblins have snuck into the house. They're trying to capture her. So she takes her ring, puts it under the pillow, and begins to follow her thread. But to her dismay, this thread does not take her up the back stairs to her fairy grandmother's room, but takes her downstairs where the sound of the growling and the snarling of the, de- of the goblins is coming from. So she tries to turn around and go back, but she realizes if she tries to go back, the thread disappears. It only works forward. So she follows the thread downstairs. It takes her outside. Not to some hiding place in the house, but outside. And then worse than that, it takes her into the goblin cave. And, 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 and right into the, the, the heart of the cave. And every time she tries to turn back, the thread disappears. So she keeps moving forward. That's all she can do. Finally, it takes her right up uh, to this wall of rock. She doesn't, even know, she doesn't know what to do. But finally, she says to herself, maybe I'm supposed to pull these rocks down. So she starts to pull down the, the wall of rock. And lo and behold, inside she finds her friend, Curdie, who had been imprisoned by the goblins. He says to her, how did you ever find me? And she says, I just followed my thread. He says, great, let's get out of here. So they follow the thread, but the thread takes them deeper into the cave. So Curdie says, this is the wrong way. Uh, the, way out, the way out is the other way. But Irene says, I never would have found you if I had stopped following my thread. I must follow my thread, even when it looks foolish, even when it looks dangerous. I must follow my thread wherever it goes. And eventually, at the end of the story, it takes her back to her fairy grandmother and to safety. Now, what's the point of this story? Yeshua knows what you need. Yeshua has a vision for your glory. And his love for you and his plan for you, however fits with the possibility of some things that look like dead ends to you. Nonetheless, you must follow your thread. You must obey him. You must be faithful to him. He says, follow me, and you must follow him. Yeshua says, follow me. He doesn't say, obey me in some abstract way. He says, follow me. Stay faithful to me. Don't go back. Continue to obey, continue to love, continue to pray, continue to worship, continue to believe. No matter how bad your outward circumstances might be, I ultimately will bring you home to me. I will. Trust me. And so number one, Yeshua is king. Number two, he's king of your salvation. Number three, he's king of your mind. Number four, he's king of your heart. Number five, he's king of your life path. And finally, number six, he's the king who can be trusted. Now, our modern secular culture says you can't let someone else impose their thread on you. You decide what's right or wrong for you. So if you just do what your culture tells you, uh, and then you hear goblins, uh, and you go on your own understanding, you just go right upstairs. And the goblins are right there, ready to eat you. (laughs) And that's the story of the human race. We say, I'm not going to follow this thread. No one has the right to impose this thread on me. But the fact is, you must trust him. You have to obey him. Or your healing will not happen. You must give up the right to self-determination. You say, well, how can I trust him? Interesting, look at Yeshua's uh, healing of uh, Peter's mother-in-law here at the text. Look at Mark 1, verse 30. Excuse me. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. They immediately told Yeshua about her, so he went into her, took her hand, helped her up, and the fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Notice Yeshua, he went out of his way to take her hand and to help her up. He did not need to do this to heal her. 
This is typical of Yeshua. Unnecessary kindness and tenderness and compassion. He could have simply said, you're healed. But over and over again, look what, look what he does. He touches the leper. He puts his hand in the mouth and the ears of the deaf mute. Here he takes her hand. Unnecessary. He has the power to heal just by willing it. But he goes out of his way to show tenderness and compassion. Because that's who he is. And here's further reason why you can trust him. You know how the story ultimately ends, right? Well, we assure he calls James and John to leave their father. But Yeshua had already left his father. He left his father's throne above. And the cross, he really is going to lose his father. And he bled and he died for you and for you and for you and for you and for me. The thread of God's will for Yeshua took him to hell. But he knew at the other end of that thread was your salvation. Here's how you can trust him. If he fouled his thread into absolute cosmic rejection and nothingness, into hell itself, you can follow your thread for him. He did all that for you. You can undergo whatever much smaller, infinitely smaller suffering you may have to endure for him. You can follow your thread for him, knowing it ultimately will lead you right into Yeshua's waiting arms. Trust him. Cry out to him today. Yeshua, I trust you. I give you my life. You, Yeshua, are my priest, my savior, my rock, my redeemer, my shepherd, my bridegroom, my Lord, my king, the lover of my soul. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Hallelujah. Leave you, Sakim, please come up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, Father, we thank you for King Yeshua. Your kingdom is at hand because the king has come. <laughs> and one day soon, Yeshua, you will come in your fullness. Hallelujah. You'll come, the scriptures tell us, you'll come as God himself, as the Davidic king, as one who brings the new covenant, giving us a new heart and a new spirit. And you bring the restored Eden. Hallelujah. And in response to this kingdom proclamation, you tell us to repent and believe. Believe the good news of your death and resurrection to atone for our sins and to give us a new life. Lord, Lord Yeshua, help us not to water down your message, but to see, see how central repentance is to your gospel. Indeed, indeed, there is no gospel. There is no salvation without repentance. So help us, Yeshua, to turn from our sin and to turn from ourself, and to turn to you, Yeshua. Lord Yeshua, right now, we leave our old life behind. We renounce our sin and ungodliness and pride and resentment and unforgiveness. We flee from all known sin, and we wholly commit ourselves to you. We make you and you alone Lord and Master and King, over every area of our life. Yeshua, when you bid a man to come to you, you bid him to come and die. Lord, help us to die to self and live for you. Help us to follow our thread wherever it takes us, wherever you take us. Because we know that ultimately you will take us home to you. And then your kingdom will come in its fullness. And we pray all this in your holy name. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.